all right all and welcome to today's stream and today we are going to be answering your questions about sports car racing oh god my light has already timed out we're gonna have to keep an eye on that one so i am joined by formula jonah for this and between us i've put out a poll on twitter and anyone else in the chat feel free to throw your questions in and we will get cracking with answering and working through them so jonah do you want to briefly introduce yourself whilst i go and uh, share some links so some people will come and join us yeah sure can um first off ewan thank you so much for having me on a uh, really big uh thank you i really appreciate uh you bringing me in here for for this stream um yeah we're going to talk all about the just everything in terms of endurance racing questions coming in a q a style live stream here um so yeah but uh if you're unfamiliar who i am uh along with you and i'm also an endurance racing uh, content creator on uh, specifically youtube um and i i create content on the wec and imsa as well as other endurance racing series um such as the bathurst 12 hour um and other series as well um but I specialize in WEC and IMSA content and covering the the racing, uh, just everything to do with that. Um, I basically just do it at least every week. Um, it used to be a thing where I do at least one video a week, and now it's turned into a, a thing where I try and do at least two or three videos a week <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of content coming out there, a lot of endurance racing. And that's what I'm so pleased about for 2024 is that we're heading into a, a new era, I think, of endurance racing. And that's something we'll discuss later on in the stream. Um, as we have the, the hypercar and GTP regulations really taking off as, as they come into, well, GTP is coming into their second year, hypercar coming into the second year of like full blown competition, uh, with the others uh, kind of joining in with like Ferrari and, um, and Peugeot full time. Um, and then, of course, we have LMP3 as well, which is a whole new thing that's really exciting, which we, of course, we'll get into later on. But yeah, I'm Jonah. Uh, I run the Formula Jonah YouTube channel. Uh, doing content creation on endurance racing. That's basically what I do. And I'm here to join uh, Ewan here on uh, this this live stream we're going to do, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun. And if you want to check out Jonah's channel, I'm sure most of you here have already seen some of his work, but it is linked in the description. So give it a subscription. Should we get right into it then with the questions? If anyone has any watching along, leave them in the chat or reply I've put a tweet out as well, which you can uh, use to reply to. And I'm just trying to... We've got one specifically for you, so let's start there. We've got from Alex Warren. How will Aston Martin decide which drivers they will pick for their hypercar efforts in both the WEC and IMSA? Any ideas on this one? Ooh, that is a good question um, and difficult to answer as well, considering we don't know a ton about what the drivers are going to look like um, for for Aston Martin's on that. But it's soon uh, from my understanding of their 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 project so far and how they've worked before and, and just judging off of hypercar um, and GTP, um, they could be taking drivers from their roster already, like in terms of their GT drivers. Um, I expect a driver like um, Nikki Team to potentially join uh, that that lineup of hypercar. Um, I believe um, Team is already racing in IMSA, so that's a that's a good way to potentially jump up to a Valkyrie program. I think that um, they could potentially pull drivers from their GT stuff, um, kind of like how BMW did with their IMSA GTP um, area as well. I think uh, Philippine was a, was one driver they pulled from GT ranks, and they they pulled him into um, the. GTP, which was good. Um, so I think they could be taking drivers from their GT um, styled programs and maybe looking into um, outside their Aston Martin program as well. There's other drivers out there that could potentially um, drive for them as well. And of course, we can get into that later if there's an opportunity. But um, yeah, I think that mainly they'll be taking drivers from their GT um, side. I absolutely agree there. They've got a lot of GT drivers, so best place to start at home. And then if they can find some talent elsewhere to go on top, nice addition to it. But when you look at who Heart of Racing have anyway, I don't think anyone knows, oh, Ross Gunn, Alex Rebras, they wouldn't look out of place in a hypercar. 
I'm going to change my lights over so that doesn't keep happening. There we go. Hopefully that should be fine now. Hello to intern. Hello to Alejandro. Hello to everyone else. Hope you're all doing well. Now, we've done five minutes. So I think it's about time we start on the balance of performance conversations because that's about as long as you can get in sports car racing these days. So from Luis, apologies if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly. I'm going to try my best. How does the political game affect BOP and would manufacturers get tired quickly if a bigger manufacturer always gets the upper hand from a BOP side? I mean, do you want me to take this one or do you want to throw in f thoughts first? Hmm. That is an interesting question. Why don't you take this first? I'm interested to see what you have to say, to be honest. Okay, so... I think it very much depends on the series and how they do their BOP. So take the World Endurance Championship in Hypercar. With that, it's completely done by an algorithm, or at least was last year. So it's pretty hard for manufacturers to gain the system because they're bigger. And then you take IMSA. That is all the manufacturers collectively agree on the BOP for each other. So that's the manufacturer's responsibility. So again, it's relatively fair these days. At the start, when it was very much someone sitting in a room doing numbers going, ah, oh, if we had 20 kilos to so-and-so, you could probably get a bit of bias in there. But these days, I think it's a pretty solid job that everyone has done to keep it as fair as possible and try and keep the politics out as much as you can. But as we saw just with the penalties announced earlier this week, sandbagging and the likes, still a bit of an issue all around the sports car scene. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Um, I think that the BOP, it, it's really like figured out by the, the, the companies involved, you know, IMSA handling their BOP, the WEC handling theirs. Um, and I think they do a pretty good job of that. Um, I know there was a bit of, controversy we could say um with the wec last season but i think that they they figured that out and i think there was a little bit of um i'm just going to say this real quickly um some confusion in terms of which was it was it bias or was it just and i i'm, I'm kind of i'm kind of into the the latter stage here and what i mean by that is um i think that with the new hypercars out on track, um, it was really hard to decipher who was going to be like what the BOP was going to look like with all these new brands like the Ferrari 499P and the, the Van Wall Van Der Vel 680 and Peugeot heading into a full season for the first time, Cadillac, Porsche, you name it, all that sort of thing. Um, and so it's hard to, it was hard to kind of see a perfect BOP. And I think that now we're heading into a second season. I think that it's going to be much better. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I think the BOP is, they handle it pretty well. Um, and I think that there's very little bias. I think that they they do a very good job, WEC, IMSA, so on, of uh, managing the BOP. Um, but like Ewan mentioned, there was a little bit of, of issue that we saw a week ago, I think you said, uh, with the BMW and Ferrari uh, penalties from Daytona. Um, and that was, that was a little bit like, like ooh, okay. What happened there you know we, we need to look into that but I, overall i think they do a pretty good job wc imsa and so on yeah absolutely and i think when you look at the wec it's very easy to compare toyota to the opposition last year when if you take say the ferrari and the porsche a brand new lmh a brand new lmdh yes there were some races ferrari were a bit ahead but overall over the course of the season and especially come Bahrain at the end of the year, they were very equal indeed. So I think that's the promising sign for 2024. What else do we have in then? Going specifically on one of the Ferraris for this season from Jonah, not you, but a namesake. We have, do you rate the number 83 AF Corsa hypercar lineup? And if so, do you think they'll bring the fight to the top dogs? Ooh. That is a great question. I really hope that answer is uh, yes, that we get to see that Ferrari take on the, the top um, top manufacturers. 
um, and fight for wins, you know, fight for podiums, all that sort of thing. Um, that 83 Ferrari, when I saw that driver lineup, oh, well, first off, let me back up. When I saw that, that a customer Ferrari was potentially coming up, um, I thought that was a great idea. I think that was huge. I think that was showing that it, Ferrari's expanding. I think they're expanding on what they could potentially do, maybe even heading into IMSA later down the road. And I'm talking years down the road. I even made a video on that, actually. Um, so that was cool. But then when I, I was kind of thinking like, okay, maybe it's just that, that third Ferrari, you know, it's just going to be like behind the factory entries. Factory entry is going to be up front. Um, and that 83 Ferrari is going to kind of be there or there about, but not like challenging those factory entries. Because, of course, they're, they're factory Ferrari 499Ps. However, that driver lineup and that team is looking really strong. The team, AF Corsa, really looking good. Um, of course, it is kind of the same team as the uh, the factory entry since it is Ferrari AF Corsa. And this is a customer AF Corsa entry. Um but that driver lineup, Robert Kibitza, Robert Schwartzman, Yifi Yi. I mean, those are three very talented drivers. I mean, Kibitza is extremely talented in endurance racing. We saw that by him being one of the drivers to win an LMP2 last season in the WEC. Um, and then, of course, if we look to his F1 days, very, very talented driver, one of the, the greatest. And if it wasn't for that horrible accident in 2011, I think it would have been um, very a very different story for his F1 perfect driver we've seen to him in formula two uh in the uh formula ranks um and i think his endurance racing career hasn't really been huge if i'm not mistaken uh but i think he's a promising driver got a lot of talent and, and yifi yi showed huge promise with hertz team jota last season with that number 38 car i think uh bahrain specifically his battles with the factory ferraris were very impressive um, I was a little skeptical over his performance heading into the 2023 season because, of course, kind of brand new driver to the team. But he really showed that he's got the pace and to, to kind of say that he's leaving Porsche, which was kind of a shock to me considering his uh, relationship was so good with Hertz team Jota. To go to Ferrari shows that that 83 car is a very, very um, interesting and very promising project uh, for the future of Ferrari. And I think that that 83 Ferrari could not just battle the factory Ferraris, but beat it. And I think that they could be in a in a shot for some podiums and potentially race wins fighting for those at least uh, with the driver lineup and the team behind it. Um, but we also have to remember, and um, I, I will mention this as well with uh, Hertz team Jota, and this goes the same for Proton, um, that 83 Ferrari is in a totally different championship. They are not in the same championship as the factory Ferraris. As that is uh, the manufacturer's uh, championship, and this is a customer team. Uh, so it's the team's championship, technically. So just wanted to point that out there as well. But overall, 83 Ferrari looking pretty promising. I think you summed it up pretty well that three drivers who would, wouldn't look out of place as a trio in any of the factory cars. Expectations have to be very high. But it's the same for Jota and Proton as well. I don't think we're going to see much of a factory privateer gap in 2024. One thing because obviously they are very closely linked to the factory cars for the AF Corsa. This is a customer effort that is technically Ferrari AF Corsa. I, if I remember correctly, due to how staffing limits in that lot works, they do have to declare who is working on each car for the most part. So it is somewhat a separate effort rather than a completely included third entry. Also, that yellow livery, I have to say, if you told me yellow, I wouldn't have been too sure about it, but seeing the renders, seeing the images from Qatar, that looks good, and I think it's going to stand out. It's a bit different, but different is what you like, because more colour on the grid, I am all for it. Yeah, I fully agree with that livery. You know, it's, it's looking pretty cool, and I was... Like the WEC even joked about it on their social media. They were saying the fans, fans wanted this, and it was kind of looking like it wasn't going to happen. But then, oh my goodness, here and behold, it's the yellow Ferrari. Uh, not expecting that at all, but a welcome surprise. Wonderful livery, as you mentioned, Ewan, and I'm really, really excited to see um, that car officially out on track. And I think another thing with it as well, and I'll just mention this real quickly before we can get on with the other the other section of this live stream. Um, it's going to be great to see that car out on track, not 
just because it's yellow, but also because it kind of differentiates between the factory Ferraris. It's it's a different car. You can tell it's not the factory Ferraris. It's a totally different livery, and that makes it different. That makes it like it, it allows us, the fans and the viewers and everybody watching, to see that oh, that's not a factory Ferrari. That's a an eighty three Ferrari. That that's a, a different car. And eventually, um, for fans for fans that are new to the WEC, they'll kind of figure out, oh, that that's not a that's not a factory, that's a customer car. So, um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I thought so. I think it really helps with the difference and being able to hammer home what's factory, what's not. And we do have a question in the YouTube chat. Anyone watching, feel free to put one in. This FR design. Uh, look not only the new hypercars, but those that raced LMP2 previously and made the step up. Who should we look out for this season? So I assume this is thinking the drivers' teams stepping up from LMP2 to hypercar. Which ones are going to make the most of this big step? And I think we've already mentioned one with the 83. The likes of Robert Kubica is coming up from LMP2 to hypercar with an excellent LMP2 resume. And also, the team side, you've got WRT. This is the biggest stage they have ever raced on. And they have heaps of talents in their BMW. And then Alpine as well, a very solid LMP2 base to their driver lineup. And who else is stepping up? Lamborghini as well, Bortolotti, Kvyat, were in LMP2 last year. And the Prima team who are helping to run the car, a bit of technical support, also coming up from LMP2. Is there any particular names which are standing out for you, which are making the jump up? Um, another team, and this is not really a part of the full season grid, but um, Duquesne uh, with LMP2 uh, Lamar entry. Um, and they're, they're primarily in ELMS, but they did make an appearance at Lamar. Um they are stepping up with the Soto Fraschini um, with their Tipo 6 LMH Competizioni. I'm interested to see how that goes. And uh, after kind of looking into that project a lot more, and I mean, I've been I've been really, really interested to see how the Soto Fraschini goes. I think Duquesne is going to be um, it's going to be good. But you mentioned the most of them, you know, and I think that um, Robert, in terms of the drivers, Robert Kibitza really, really um, was hoping that he would get a seat on the grid in hypercar. It's happened. To be honest, I made a whole video, I think, last year about him going to Hertz Team Jota because that was the rumor at the time. And then, lo and behold, he's over at AF Corsa. So, nice surprise. Brings back uh, the F1 um, rumors that he was going to Ferrari back in, I think it was 2012, to replace Massa. Um, and this is this is a, a dream for, for those fans that, that knew about those rumors going on back then. And also, um, a dream just in general to see um, a Polish racer and as famous and as uh, skilled as Robert Kibitza on the grid. So Kibitza, um, Bordelotti, very quick driver as well uh, to see him going in. That's that's great. Kvyat as well, Danny Kvyat, um, another driver coming into hypercar from LMP2. Um, and Dorian Pin is going into GT. She's not going into hypercar. I just wanted to mention her real quickly. Very skilled racer. Um, I just wanted to mention that because we were talking about Prima in general. Uh, from the LMP2 grid. But I think you mentioned the most of them, you and I think there's a lot of promising talent coming in. I think I've just got a text message, so apologies if that came up on screen. Uh, or I on, don't on think it did, so we should be fine okay, on thank that goodness. front. <laughs> very good, very good. Yes. But yeah, um, good question, by the way. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of good drivers, a lot of good teams uh, heading into LMP2. And I think the one that's, that I'm most looking forward to in terms of a team-based from LMP2 to Hypercar is Team WRT. Yeah, and I also think, I forgot to mention it exactly, it's some of the young talents as well, which are really exciting me. I mentioned Alpine, but the likes of a Sean Malese, big break for him, and he has been getting better and better in LMP2. And also Jota, Hertz Jota expanding to two cars. You've got Phil Hansen and Oliver yeah. Rasmussen both getting their big breaks over in the hypercar class as well which is going to be very exciting to see how this next generation of sports car drivers are getting on as you've got the veterans on the grid the Andre Lotteras, Sebastian Buemis of the world you've got that kind of prime of their career right now not saying Buemi and Lotterer aren't at their very best but age-wise they probably won't still be here in a decade 
You've got kind of like that Kevin Estra generation. And then you've got this youth generation coming through of the Hansons, Rasmussens and plenty more youngsters on the grid who are still going to be at this race and in this sport for 20, 30 years to come, which is the exciting thing. Alejandro saying he was surprised to not see the Prima team having a hypercar program with a manufacturer of their own. I will just answer this one quickly. Prima and Iron Lynx, Iron Dames, they are now all under the same ownership structure and have been for a couple of years. So the Iron Lynx hypercar effort, there is Prima involvement in that one and it's kind of a joint effort between Iron Lynx and Prima but it's going under the Iron Lynx name. I think um, out of all the full season LMP2 grid from last year, the only two teams that didn't move up to hypercar are are um, United Autosports and Inter Europol. Uh, Inter Europol and United Autosports have both moved over to full season entries over in IMSA uh, in the LMP2 class. I believe that's it in terms of every team on the full season grid from LMP2 last year. Um, Jota's um, number 28 car is not on the grid either, of course, um, but that's because they're moving up to to hypercar. So technically that's, that's not a, a problem. But yeah, um, so those are the only two teams and United is also... Um, in LMGT3 full time this year uh, with McLaren, um, and both of those teams that raced Inter Europol and United Autosports are returning to Le Mans for an LMP2 entries, uh, which will be great to see, of course, as those are two legendary teams. So just wanted to point that out there. Yeah, we've got Mr. Waffles. What do you guys think about Ferrari and BMW getting their points white from mm -hmm. Daytona? Going to have a major impact on the points long term this year. Personally, I think. My big thing with that is I would like a little more information from IMSA as I know I've done my best, others have done their best to piece together exactly what has gotten on there. But I think if they could just give a completely transparent answer, it would remove any doubts. But generally, I think if you have been sandbagging, getting your points removed seems like a fair enough penalty under the system IMSA have, which relies on manufacturer honesty, and the manufacturers, when they sign up to the GT classes, they are agreeing to be honest and help with the BOP process and not do the sandbagging. So I think it is relatively fair. Just a shame it has to be done, really. It is a shame. Yeah, it's not fun, you know, to see that... Uh... These two prestigious manufacturers have been penalized um, over over that, but l like you mentioned, I mean, it is a fair penalty. I think um, it's it's unfortunate, of course, considering both are very very good brands. You know, BMW and Ferrari are very um, successful in endurance racing as well. But this is what it is. I mean, we saw um, not the same penalty, uh, not the same um, like situation, I guess, um, but with MSR last year in 2023, uh, their points got completely removed from the race at Rolex 24 um, and they were hefty they're handed a, a hefty fine which is um, of course not great um, and that that had repercussions on their their hopes for the 2023 championship um, so yeah it's unfortunate to see that's that's happened of course um, and I'm curious to find out a little bit more info on uh, on all that sort of thing um, but yeah it is what it is there's nothing more we can really do I guess right now yeah, pretty much. Just wait and see what more we get. Uh, from exactly. Intern, if Honda make the jump to the WEC, who do you see driving the ARX? I'd love for Iwasa to get a seat like that. I absolutely agree. Someone like Aruma Iwasa, sorry, I think I've just butchered his name slightly, would be great to see in Formula... Well, he's currently in Formula 2. Would be great to see in a hypercar. I also think you'd be looking at... It depends which team jumped to WEC with them. Say it was an Andretti. I think you could see a bit like as we have had with Ganassi over recent years. It's kind of part of their GTP effort migrating over. Maybe a bit of double duty. But the Albuquerques, the Delatrazes of the world have made it perfectly clear that they'd like to go to Le Mans with an Acura in the top class. And also... They are regulars on the World Endurance Championship circuit. 
Yeah, I fully agree with you on uh, on the thoughts there on Honda. It's a really interesting situation because if Honda joins, that would be huge for their brand as as a whole. It'd be huge for the WEC to get another manufacturer. Um, and I think it's Honda making their official debut in, in the top prototype class at Le Mans, which would be huge um, for their their potential possibilities of taking the win. I really want to see that ARX 06 over at Le Mans. Uh, time a one entry in the wc and maybe two at le mans and i think that's where we could see the likes of delatraz albuquerque and all that sort of thing because they they are they are racing in imsa and it'd be hard for them to race in wc and imsa full time um so i think that the the only option for them would be to come over to le mans um and race the second car if they they get an opportunity um oasa would make a, a good driver uh for for the team I think that would be great for for Honda's sake to have a Japanese driver in in that car. Uh, huge, huge prospect. I think he's a very talented racer from what we've seen over in Formula Two. Um, and I don't know if there's possibilities for him to get an F1, but if there's not, I think a WEC drive with a, a potential Honda effort would be would be great. Um, I mean, there's other drivers as well you could put in that car. I think one of them, and this is a long stretch, and someone I want to see back in hypercar. Um, is Tom Dillman. I know that's kind of a, a long shoot, and I know that's a, that's kind of like a, uh, I don't know if he can go there, but uh, I'd like to see Tom Dillman in a top prototype car once again in, in hypercar. I think he's got the talent. Um, however, an Acura drive or Honda drive, I don't know if that's possible, but um, I could potentially see someone like Tom Dillman in a hypercar drive, although I don't know if it's going to be Honda or Acura. So, but yeah, Iwasa would make sense for me. Albuquerque, Delatraz uh, in a second car. And as for the other two drivers, um, it's I'd have to really like sit down and think about it. It's not something like I said, think about the top of my head because it's it's a really long it's a really long think I guess. <laughs> Great point in the chat from Mr. Waffles. Sorry, I'm definitely not pronouncing that one right. That you do also have with Honda, you have their pool of Super GT, Super Formula drivers from Japan, who they could also very likely lean on for a move to the WEC. But I have to say, I really like the Tom Dillman shout. Several years with Baikoles Van Wall, never really got the chance to fully prove himself due to the machinery underneath him. So I think he's he's earned a second shot in hypercar with someone at some point. Also, question about Maya Shank Racing from FR Design. Who do you think will bring them back to the GTP grid? First of all, I know some fans have soured on them a little, but I would love to see Maya Shank back in GTP. Did feel very strange not having them at the Rolex 24 this year. I think obviously the dream for them would be a factory program of some sort. There's a few manufacturers who have been floating around talks with joining IMSA who are already competing in hypercar. You know, you've got the Alpines, the Peugeots of the world who have kind of gone. We'd be tempted to do a little bit of IMSA at some point. The other are fine. Oh. But yeah, hopefully everything uh, MSR will be back on the grid at some point. Jonah, do you have any particular preference on who is in there? Well, who MSR could return to GTP with? Right, I think we've lost him for a second, so whilst Jonah hopefully returns at some point, I will go through some of the questions put in on Twitter, and also if anyone watching has any questions, stick them in the chat, or let me know if you can still see slash hear Jonah, because could just be a technical issue on my end, never know about that one. So from... Raman is human. Do you think BMW will have a good performance this year? Are we going to have another champion or is Toyota going to dominate again? I think we've already discussed earlier on that WRT, great team, very excited to see what they can do in hypercar. Uh, so I think BMW will have 
a solid, strong performance this year. If they don't get a single podium, I would be shocked. Whether they're able to take wins, whether they're able to fight for the title, the level in hypercar is very high, so we're going to have to wait and see on that front. And as we're on the BMW question, great point by FR Design, Jonah has ended up being eaten by the BMW M Hybrid V8, as was a mechanic earlier. If you want to go and check out Graham Goodwin's Twitter feed, the second part of that question, are Toyota going to be dominant again? I am going to say no. I don't think Toyota will dominate. If you saw last year, the gap was going down every time at Sebring. They, it was pretty comfortable for them at Sebring. By Fuji, they did not have room to make mistakes. Monza, they didn't have room to make mistakes. Le Mans, they made a couple of mistakes and they lost that race. So when you look at the trend, they can absolutely still win the title. And I would say they do come in as favourites, but they are not. And that's it. Can we get Jonah back? There we go. He is back. Sorry about that. I had a little bit of technical issues, but I'm, I'm back. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. It's good to uh, see you here again. We were just addressing, are Toyota going to dominate again or not? Do you have an opinion on that one? Who? Yes, I do have an opinion on that one, actually. <laughs> um, I would, I'm going to go bold and say no. I'm going to say no. no. Uh, I, what are you predicting, Jonah? But uh, yeah, I'm going to say no. And the reason why is because we're heading into the second season. Um, and maybe you already said this already, but maybe I, I didn't hear because, of course, I was having issues. Um, but uh, I think Toyota, they are very experienced most experienced manufacturer on the hypercar grid, if you ask me. However, we are heading into the second season with Porsche, Ferrari, Peugeot, uh, all these manufacturers that have now had experience at the WEC hypercar schedule, and they're going to have a lot more performance, I think. I think at uh, D Daytona, we saw that Porsche was very quick, and while that's a completely different championship, completely different BOP, um, I think that Porsche... Um, may be able to take a little bit of that performance over to the WEC and potentially uh, fight for wins with Ferrari and um, and Toyota, of course. Um, so while Toyota is, is very dominant, I would say that uh, they're not going to be as dominant as, as last season. I still think that they're going to be the manufacturer to be. I still think that they have the best chance at winning the championship. However, I think they're going to have a little bit more competition this year. Absolutely agreed on all of that one. Alejandro, why does Silverstone in the UK doesn't want to have a WEC race? You'd also like to see the Nürburgring and Shanghai back. Silverstone, if I remember correctly, lost the race for a few reasons. I think one of the big ones is, without getting political, so please, chat, don't touch on politics, the extra issues and hassle of getting into the UK after the UK left the EU certainly hasn't helped the fact and then there's all issues about who's going to cover the cost of the racing especially in a time when attendances were down a little for 2019 for the last one so I can see why Silverstone wouldn't jump straight away and then as they shrunk the calendar when you're making your choices say you've got Ferrari so Mons is a logical choice Spa, you're not going to have a season without Spa, and then Le Mans. So it's just difficult trying to fit Silverstone into the European leg of the season. But I agree, Silverstone, Nürburgring, Shanghai, all good circuits, and all of them I wouldn't be opposed to seeing again at some point. Yeah, I think that uh, the Silverstone situation is quite of interesting because it's like, I think everybody that is an endurance racing fan, at least the majority of, of everybody, um, would love to see Silverstone back on the calendar. It is a fantastic circuit. Um, I mean, we've seen Formula One race there many times. It's the first track to ever appear on the F1 calendar. Um, of course, different variation, but yeah. Um, so I think that we would all like to see Silverstone back on, on the, the calendar. It is, like I said, an amazing circuit. However, um, there is complications in the way of it having a race. 
and so I don't think it's possible. Uh, Shane High, um, it it could could make a return. I, I could potentially see that. However, according to the recent rumors, there hasn't been a lot of talk over a potential um, Shane High return uh, to the to the wonderful Chinese circuit. Um, Nurburgring as well. Um, I don't think that's that's going to return. Unfortunately, again, another circuit where we would love to see the WEC race at. Um, the, the last time I think they did was in 2015, but I could be wrong on that. I think 2015 or maybe 2016 was the last race. Um, you and you're probably better on on the, those facts than me. It was 2017, the last one. It was uh, 2017. Uh, last year okay. before okay. we went to the uh, Super Season okay. format. Uh, FR Design, another one. Will we see our was... first LMDH win in the WEC this season? And why is it most likely Porsche? If you want us to make the case for Porsche, Ooh. I think the uh, simple one is they've got five cars, Cadillac have one, and everyone else has new cars. <laughs> so uh, the numbers suggest that if an LMDH wins, it will probably be a Porsche. And... I do think we will see an LMDH win this year. Not sure which, not sure when, but there's too much talent across Porsche, Cadillac, BMW, Lamborghini and Alpine for one of them not to end up in victory lane at some point over the course of the year. Yeah, I fully agree. I think uh, the point you mentioned where Porsche has got five cars, Cadillac has one um, and everybody else is new is 100% correct and totally agree because it's true. I mean, Porsche has five cars, five, five. That's amazing. Now we've never seen that many 963s on the grid across the full season. And actually including Le Mans, we have not seen that. Le Mans had four cars, I believe. And at Le Mans, we could be seeing, well, we're going to see six, potentially even seven uh, Porsche 963s, which is crazy because of the number 78 on the reserve list um from proton competition although i don't know if that's going to happen but yeah um i think an lmdh car will win a race this season and i think it will come from porsche however um and i'm just going to say this this is a very bold prediction i think there could be a potential win for cadillac um and i think that that win could be le mans now that's a bold prediction that is a but bold looking one. at it from 2023, Cadillac had a it's very bold. Cadillac had a very strong car at uh, at Le Mans. Uh, they have three cars at Le Mans, uh, the same amount as Ferrari. Um, and think about it: if Toyota or Ferrari doesn't really have um, a strong race, I mean, if they are hit by BOP or there's some sort of reliability or collision, and I doubt that will be happening, to be honest. Um, Cadillac is right in the mix of it. I think that they will be because Cadillac. If we look at the manufacturer, their primary focus is IMSA and Le Mans. They're focusing on the WEC as well, but not as much. Le Mans is their focus because it is, of course, the pinnacle of motorsport. Uh, IMSA is their focus because of the American market. You know, there's uh, Cadillac is prominent here in the U.S. Um, and so they're focusing the majority of their attention on IMSA. That's why they also are having two cars. Um, but Cadillac was... They, they're focusing their attention on Le Mans, which means that they are putting so much time and they're making that car ready for Le Mans specifically. So to have three cars there with a chance of potentially getting a win, I think that's their best option. Um, another opportunity could be at Bahrain. They were looking very strong in qualifying last year, uh, qualifying, I believe, P3 just behind the two Toyotas, if I'm not mistaken. They were hit with... Um, the, I think there was a collision with the, the Toyota at the start, the number seven car, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, they were handed a penalty, and from then on, they just kind of were, were screwed. Another thing, too, is that Chip Ganassi Racing um, it was brand new to Bahrain. They they barely even raced there. I To my knowledge, they've never raced there before. Um, I could be wrong on that. But um, Cadillac, um, with Chip Ganassi Racing, barely any experience. So they are they're kind of heading into it blind. And to see them P3 in their basically first race in hypercar at that track shows that that car potentially could have pace at, uh, at Bahrain. And Bahrain kind of heads into a night race as well. We know that Cadillac can kind of be good in the, the day-to-night cycle. Um, it's not super great in full night conditions as we saw at Daytona, but we know that it can be very good in the day and then the transition to night as well. So... That, and that's kind of where Bahrain kind of goes as we head into the eight-hour event. So 
A win for an LMDH car besides Porsche could potentially come from Cadillac either at Le Mans or Bahrain. That's effectively what I'm saying. I think Le Mans especially is such a big opportunity for every manufacturer to get a win even if they're going in as one of the underdogs, as if you look back to last year's race, not a single car had a completely clean run throughout the 24 hours. So if you are just able to get that clean run in, we don't know. Six cars might have a clean run and it might not be good enough for the podium, but it also might just be what you need to do to be able to get the win. So I think everyone has to look at Le Mans and go, this is our big opportunity. I will give you an option, Jonah. I don't know if you have any of the tweets up or whatever, but if there's any particular questions which stand out to you and you want to throw out, we're going to intimate this about an hour. So that means we have hit about 20 minutes to go. All right, let me look through some of these, these streams real quickly and see if there's a specific, a specific um, tweet that kind of um, catches my eye. And I've already found it. Uh, coming from Hugo, who asks, should ELMS allow an LMH car? Or an LMH class, sorry. Um, I think it would be fun, but not allowing official teams, just support to private ones, so that when the manufacturer's boom eventually ends, we will uh, have strong private teams. If I'm allowed another, is it time for WBC to expand its calendar? So two questions technically in there. But the first one is, should ELMS allow an LMH class? I am going to say no for now, because I think we've already seen with Proton getting left off, Hypercar is full at Le Mans. And I don't think there's the business case to do Hypercar if you're not at Le Mans or in IMSA. So I think... There also probably isn't the customer market quite yet there to be able to afford to open it up to the European Le Mans series. When LMP2 in the ELMS is so strong with over 20 cars on the grid, you might as well just enjoy that as the top class as it's so abundant and going to be so competitive in 2024. I don't think adding what could maybe just be two or three hypercars at the top is something worth considering in the short term. In the long term, if the costs for hypercar start coming down a bit, then I think there's definitely the option. And I'm not opposed to it, but I just think short term. And the second one, WEC expanding their calendar. Unless, do you want to comment on ELMS and LMH first before we address part um. two? Yeah, I guess I'll just quickly mention it since we have the second question and more, of course, to answer. Um, with the ELMS situation, fully agree. Um, and I also think that um, LMP2, it, the ELMS is centered, LMP2 is the main class. Um, and to take to take Hypercar or the LMH regulations or LMDA regulations into um, ELMS um, would be bad for the customer uh, LMP2 projects of all the teams ent entering because that would take them away from fighting for the overall victory. Um, and then it's kind of like, why am I even in LMP2? That's eventually what happened with Hypercar is that LMP2 kind of fizzled out as all the teams went over to Hypercar. So LMP2 racing has to go somewhere, right? And I think ELMS is the perfect place for that. Um, IMSA has it as well, but uh, it's not really... Um, it's it's a different championship, you know, and, and there's European um, racing, which is where the LMP2 class kind of lies. And that's where teams like Vector Sports can uh, can race, for example. But anyway, um, I just want to quickly note, uh, I just quickly wanted to mention that. But uh, moving on to the WEC calendar expansion, um, yes and no. And that's a kind of a weird answer, I know, but um, hear me out real quickly. Um, I think the WEC could expand... And this is the facts. Can't go any more than that. And the reason why is because they'd be colliding with IMSA's schedule, with the LMS schedule, with events at like uh, the 24 hours of Nurburgring, for example. Um, and it's just too many races. Uh, we're already going to see a few cal calendar clashes this year. One in particular that's really not good is the Modal Course de Monterey at Laguna Seca for IMSA and the six hours of Spa for the WEC on the same weekend. That prevents teams um, like, for example, the the yellow Cadillac or gold Cadillac is that's what the American manufacturer wants us to call it um, from heading over to spawn. So that means like, for example, the 
at Spa last year, we saw that number three Cadillac on the grid, but this year we can't see it because IMSA has Laguna Seca uh, at the same event, uh, at the same time, I guess, um, which is okay, but at the same time, that kind of doesn't really work out. But I've seen too many injuries and too many um, calendar clashes, and I just don't think it would work out. I think they could expand to maybe one, maybe two more races, but beyond that, no, I don't think it would be good uh, for an endurance racing spectacle such as the WEC and for uh, its other championships um, such as IMSA, ELMS and all that sort of thing. I think you've pretty much hit the nail on the head there. I think eight is a very good number to settle on because it's not like we've got any two month breaks this year, which has played the championship for the previous few seasons. But we now have no. We don't have so many races. We've already got three IMSA clashes, which maybe if we tried really hard could have been avoided. But any more, you're just going to have too many clashes. And most people aren't WEC fans, they're endurance fans. So right. it hurts the WEC product when it clashes with the 24 hours of Spa, for instance, or an IMSA race or anything like that. And if anything, this is a hot take of mine. I wouldn't mind if IMSA thinned down their calendar by a race or two and have bigger events but less races as such. Interesting. I like that prediction because that, that's that's a good point to mention because IMSA, from my understanding, has 11 rounds altogether um, and WEC only has eight. So to equal it out a little bit more, it would be more um, acceptable if IMSA went down to 10, for example, and to have the WEC up to 9, that would make it a little bit more equal um, and not so like the scale kind of tipping towards IMSA favor in terms of the calendar. Um, but of course, it's hard to say that we want one one brand or one oper operation to have more races than the other because both are extremely incredible motorsports. And that goes the same for, for other endurance racing series out there as well. Um, but I agree. I agree on that take. I think that um, if if IMSA went down a race or two, I wouldn't be opposed to it, considering that the WEC could potentially go up. That could potentially uh, happen. We can see other races, maybe at like Kayami, for example, or Shanghai, or some other track like, across the world. Yeah, one question from Winston Chevrolet in the chat. What are your opinions on requiring every manufacturer to build a hypercar in the next regulation change? I assume that's referring to an LMH hypercar rather than an LMDH. Personally, part of what has made this hypercar GTP era so successful is the fact manufacturers have the choice of what they want to do. And I think for the next set of regulations, the balancing between the two is going to be even better than it is now. So I think keeping it how it is, with as many options as the manufacturers require. The organizers say we want cars that go this quickly for this long and letting in everyone who can achieve that safely, I think is the best solution for the future. Yeah, I think this question is um, is going around the Le Mans hypercar regulations. As, uh, as you mentioned, LMDH, um, they cannot do this. It's not possible. Um, the regulations is, is separate. Um, and I think, I, I think it's, it's an option. I think that, that it is an option that's not, cause I, I don't think it's required from, from teams. Um, it's just an option, correct? Yeah. yeah. So the, that would be, that's better. If it was required, I would say that's not really fair, I guess, cause there's other manufacturers out there that are like, Oh, we're not too big. We can't do this as well as a, as a racing project as well. So to have it as an option is much better or to be it to be derived from a from a hypercar and to me this just brings back the days of gt1 this brings back the wonderful days of gt1 when we had um the 911 uh porsche um that was derived from uh, they made a race uh, they made the race car into a road car or vice versa um and same thing goes for the toyota ts020 uh, or uh gt1 as some others call it as well um, and those were the days where it was just like, oh, we're taking road cars and we're turning them into race cars kind of thing um, in the top 
prototype ranks in the top main championship um, fighting for overall victories. And I think that that's something we see in, in the normal GT ranks, but to see it over for overall is great as well. And to see that kind of transition back into the Le Mans hypercar regulations in some way, it's not totally the same as GT1 as it will never be. Um, but to see that there's an option to build road going hypercars, like for instance, the Sotto Fraschini Strada, uh, LMH Strada, um, or, um, I believe Ferrari also did one as well. And technically the Aston Martin Valkyrie is a road car as well. That's, that's going into the AMR pro version, which is into the Le Mans hypercar, pro, um, uh, version as well. So it's all kind of connected for Aston Martin's project. So I think, I think that's great. I think that's an awesome, uh, feature. But like I said before, if it was um, required, I wouldn't support it. But to see that it's um, a, an option is much better. And I think that that's a, a great way of doing things. Yep, agreed on that front. And Girun Dan, if a manufacturer chooses to build a new car but already have an existing car, are the customer teams forced to switch to that model too? And the answer to that one is no, but generally over time as the manufacturer will transition customer support towards their new car, it makes sense for people to stop using the old one. We are still seeing, so for example, at the Bathurst 12 hour, what was it, two weekends ago now? Mm -hmm. One weekend yeah. ago, just one week, we still had the old Porsche 911, the 991 spec racing. And last year, Ferrari, there was a mix of 296s and 488s still out racing in GT3. For hypercar, I'd assume everyone would transition over pretty much straight away, assuming the manufacturer offered the customer car out straight away. But we're yet to have a test of that theory. So probably two or three years time, we'll find out the answer to that one. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see um, if if and when that happens, you know, if they try, if the manufacturer has their factory updated car as a non-updated car or the, the original car, I guess, until they, they come with the, the new the new spec, I guess. Um, but I think the fact is, is that there's barely any customer cars on the grid. Porsche is primarily the main uh, one, and technically there's a Ferrari uh, customer effort but that's that's it's different different operation but still it's kind of connected to a of course in some way um but the porsche effort i think that if porsche changed over with a like an updated version of the 963 or a completely different car if we come to that um they will switch all their customer entries out as well i don't think that um they would have a, a i don't think they would make the customer entries uh, or the customer teams um, have the old 963 package or whatever. Um, but again, it's kind of hard to speculate considering that it's not really apparent at this time. Um, the only manufacturer that I could potentially see um, an old car with a customer effort would be maybe like Toyota, for example. Um, if Toyota, um, if they got a customer program, this is if, of course, they had a customer program with another team on the grid, and they had the, the GR010, and then later on, like three years down the line or two years down the line, they changed to the GR020, which has been rumored for quite some time. Um, it's possible that the customer entry might still be the GR010, um, and then maybe later on they changed it to the GR020. Um, but I could also just see them um, just changing it all, all the customer entries, all the, the factory entries to, to the same car. So, and again, this is, we're all speculating I don't know where it goes though. And going through a few more questions over on the Twitter, here's one, Matt's Bernard, which I think stands out. Taking the idea of the rap, rap record lap set at Bathurst, do you believe it'd be a cost effective measure of a GT3 series like the DTM to bolt on class one style DRS wings? could change that would part series apart from the rest of the competition. So I think for this one, it's all about weighing up the cost. And for me, I don't think the cost adds up for much more than 
hot lapping to add to the likes of DRS to a GT3 car right now. Although I have to say that AMG GT3, that Jules Gounon, set a brief lap record at Bathurst around as already Roman de Mar in the uh, Ford Transit van has uh, taken that away from him. That's an incredible sentence. I don't think Mercedes were quite expecting to uh, hear just a week later. But yeah, I think it was a mega car for a one-off and I'd love to see it a bit like the 919 Evo now go to the likes of the Nordschleife and see what I can do there. But I think for racing, probably the numbers don't quite add up. Yeah, I fully agree. I don't think there's much I can really say. say you pretty much wrapped it up and I think that uh fully agree with everything you said there. Um, it would be interesting to see um, if if it ever happened, but uh, in terms of the actual racing, I don't think it's possible. Like you mentioned, the numbers don't really line up there. Yeah, because we've had a few attempts in the past. With right. FIA GT1 back in 2012, they considered the souped-up GT3, and a couple of other series since the DTM in 2021, and LM GT3 as well at one point. There was discussions about how far you'd go from base GT3. But every time, I think the conclusion has been anything major, you start to lose the cost effectiveness, which is why GT3 is so popular in the first place. True, true. Now... We are nearing our hour, so Jonah, do you want to pick another question to potentially take us home? Sure, let me take a look here. Um, we have, and again, thank you so much to everybody who's um, kind of come in and, and send in all these questions uh, through Twitter, through YouTube, all that sort of thing. Uh, great to see, um, great to see. Um, all these people coming in. The support has been huge. Really appreciate uh, all your support. Um, I'm looking through Twitter right now, um, and we just had a, uh, a question uh, from Full Metal Lemon six minutes ago um, who asks, uh, do you think the double Jota effort will benefit uh, of hinder these their efforts against or hinder these efforts against AF Corsa? I think that was supposed to be R, uh, or instead of of. Um, so yeah, do you think the the Jota effort will benefit or hinder um, the AF Corsa against the AF Corsa um, effort in the customer entry? I think having well two cars, it always gives you the option on the strategy game, and we've seen Jota last year. They tended to be pretty aggressive on the strategy at times. Sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't for them. But this, it means they can get aggressive with one car, but have a second to play it safe with. So I think that's the option. What's worth noting is for the championship for privateer teams, the World Cup, it is scored by car. So it isn't like Jota are picking their best car or totaling the two cars points together. It is the 38 against the 12 against AF Corsa and Proton. So they don't get a huge advantage points-wise, but little options when it comes to picking up wins, getting extra data in as well will prove very handy for them indeed. Yeah, I think Hertz Team Jota will be very uh, successful with their two-car effort. I think this is a, a really strong start, and it really proves that this team is not like a customer team that's going to be below the factory Penske's. This is a team that's going to be fighting for, for overall wins. And while they won't fight for the overall championship of hypercar, they're definitely going to be proving that they can do that. Um, and in the world cup, they will do so with the 38. Um, and then of course the 12 also fighting against the 38, which is an interesting situation, you know, to see that uh, the, the, these are two team cars fighting against each other, but at the end of the day, they are the same team. Um, I think that it's going to be a close battle between AF Corsa's number 83 and the, the 12 and the 38 and even the 99 Proton Porsche. Uh, we'll see how that all works out. But um, I think I think what Jota has right now, or Hertz Team Jota, with the two-car effort could potentially open up the doors for AF Corsa uh, to potentially bring in a second 
car as well um, later on, maybe 2025, 2026, in terms of a customer uh, 499PF fourth Ferrari, which would be really weird and also really cool at the same time, considering that uh, it'd be a, a second customer entry. Um, but I don't know. It's going to be really interesting. I, I don't really have a ton of information at this time um, when it comes to the Battle in the World um, Teams Cup, I guess we call it, um, between Hertz Team Jota, Proton, and, and A of Corsa. Um, so it could it could benefit um, Jota, could benefit A of Corsa. Um, well, I guess we'll have to see how that all goes when we hit to um, the Qatar 18, 12 kilometer in just a, a week's time, which is crazy to think that that's coming up so fast, you know, and I mean, we're we're so close to the start of the season as well. And I guess that's kind of a good transition point as well. Absolutely. Yes, it is. What now? We've got 18 hours until the start. No, my maths doesn't check up on that. 16 hours until the start of oh. running for the prologue. So the WEC season really is right around the corner. And on that note, we have hit an hour. So unless anything particularly jumps out to you, should we call it a day here? I guess so. It's been a very successful stream. Uh, I, I, I got to say, Ewan, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure to join you here uh, to discuss endurance racing, discuss um, all that's coming up as we come into the WEC season. Uh, IMSA has already started up, but we're getting ready for our uh, the Sebring event coming up uh, in the middle of March, I believe, on the 16th, um, and it's going to be it's going to be insane. I cannot wait for this endurance racing se series. It's the best we've seen it, it with these new regulations of hypercar and GTP, um, and with LMGT3 coming into the WEC, that's just going to spark up so much stuff uh, for endurance racing and for GT racing in particular. Um, but again, Ewan, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much for joining me. And I'm sure most of you listening recognize Jonah. But if you don't, top line of the description, click that link and then click that subscribe button. Let's get into what are you on? 22,000? Is 25k the next goal? That is the next goal. Yeah, 25. Uh, I think it's 22,000 around uh, right now so far. Um, yeah, let's... that's. Go ahead. Sorry. No, you go. No, you go. Yeah, it's just uh, I'm. Yeah, again, I'm. I'm really just the, the number one thing I'm thankful for is all the people that are coming in. You know, the content is great and all. It's it's great to put out the content, but ultimately, what I do and I'm sure you feel the same, Ewan, is that we're putting out the content for for the viewers because of our passion. You know, this is endurance racing. We love endurance racing, um, and. To see that content be uh, be liked by so many people, it just makes my day, you know. And I, I'm sure uh, you and you feel the same in terms of when someone comments something nice and they say, um, "Oh, keep up the good work. I really enjoyed this. Um, it's it's nice to hear this that more endurance racing content on YouTube. Um, it's just it gives a confidence boost. It really does. And it just for me personally, when I hear comments like that, it just makes me feel like doing more content <laughs> it just makes me feel like going going further and that's hopefully uh what we'll do and um yeah and again i want to say real quickly um if you guys have not already also subscribe to ewan's channel i watch his content every video that you come out with i watch uh because it is informative and you got some of the best content when it comes to endurance racing on youtube um so definitely subscribe to his channel as well um but yeah Thank you very much for joining us and thank you everyone who has watched along whether you've put in a question or not and whether we got to that question or not it is very much appreciated. This has been a lot of fun to do and perhaps we'll do it again some time but now I will leave you all to go and enjoy your Sunday.